A big question in the study of biblical eldership is the question of whether or not women can be elders. This subject is certainly polarizing. In the Western world, uh, egalitarianism is running rampant. That is the, the teaching that men and women are equal in all regards and there are no role distinctions among men and women in the church. But the Bible is very specific in its statements regarding the roles of men and women in the church. And it's important that we understand this, particularly as it relates to leadership and being elders. Now we can't go into every aspect of this subject because the uh, arguments are, are very technical in, at, at times. Uh, I've written extensively on this subject and so has Alexander Strzok, another member of our, our biblical eldership resource teams and we'll refer you to some of those writings. But here I'd like to present the, the sweeping flow of how gender affects uh, a person's ability to lead or a person's uh, prerogative to lead in the local church. But first of all, I'd like to talk about the foundational principles that we're gonna build on. And the first principle is that all of scripture is inspired and is without error. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be equipped, adequate for every good work. You see, the scripture is God's word, it's inspired and it is without error. But do you notice that it's useful for the Christian walk? It's not just a matter of uh, knowing the right things or being right, it's a matter of doing and acting out in right ways. And the scripture makes it clear that we are to use the scripture itself in how we order the functioning of the church. Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter, 1 and verse, chapter 3 verse 15, I write you so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. So the first principle is that the word of God is inspired, it's inerrant. The second foundational principle is that the Paul's writings are therefore inspired by God also. Why do I stress this point? Well, it's because most of the New, teaching, New Testament teaching on gender roles in the church are in Paul's letters. And some hold uh, some extreme views of the writings of Paul. Some would suggest that Paul is a misogynist, that means he's a woman hater, he's prejudiced, or at best he's chauvinist. Others maybe aren't quite so extreme, but they talk about Paul being inadvertently affected by his culture, influenced in a way that maybe wasn't God's original intention. Now these particular viewpoints assume that Paul's writings were not inspired, at least not when it comes to gender issues. But there's others who hold to a high uh, respect for the writings of Paul and put it on order of scripture, who would say that Paul knowingly acquiesced to the culture of his day so as not to uh, incur a stumbling block for the spread of the gospel but that if you follow his trajectory, that at some point in time when the gospel is accepted, people would have a mature understanding and, and see where Paul was ultimately leading, and that was that there would be no distinctions between male and female in the local church whatsoever. Um, now today, there's, there's all kinds of novel ways for interpreting the key passages. But in all regard, they, 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 they're novel, they're, they're new, and we have to ask ourselves, are they correct, or is the traditional understanding that has been held to for thousands of years that there is a role distinction, are those the ones that are correct? So the writings of Paul are crucial to the subject of gender in the church, in particular, our study of the role of elders. So we must begin with the fact that whatever these passages mean that we're gonna talk about, they are inspired and they are from the mind of God. Now let's listen to what Peter says as he's inspired by the Spirit of God when he talks about Paul's writings. It, it, this is so important that we, we, we have to emphasize this. Peter writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 to 16, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of things in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and unstable distort, 
as they do also the rest of scripture to their own destruction. Writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Peter refers to Paul's writings on the same level as, quote, the rest of scripture. Notice, I find this tremendously encouraging. Peter writes about Paul's writings as being difficult to understand. I feel like I'm in good company because some of his writings, I agree, are difficult to understand. God doesn't always put truth on the lower branches, on the lower shelf. Sometimes we have to dig for them. And with Paul's writings, that sometimes is very much true. But we, we are, are, are doing a dis, an injustice to carelessly or ignorantly handle the writings of Paul and to tamper with scripture because we're tampering with the very word of God and we do so at our own peril. The third foundational principle is that the biblical writers wrote within a certain cultural context and these things need to be taken into careful consideration. Too easily though, people dismiss the teachings of scripture by punting, as I would call it, to cultural issues. It goes something like this. Um, we don't do that sort of thing today uh, because the scriptural teaching is confined to the first century culture and they did those sorts of things back in the old days. However, God did at times, we all acknowledge, he took some culturally significant activities and immortalized them for the church across all cultures. For example, baptism was not unique to Christianity. It was something that uh, some of the cults would practice as an initiatory rite. But we see that God has taken that and used that as a symbol, it's an enduring symbol that most evangelical Christians, Bible-believing Christians would hold to. The Lord's Supper is another one. It was a communal celebration meal to express the oneness of a group of people and, and, and Jesus himself taking it from the, uh, the Passover uh, Supper, but also the Christians recognizing that this is something that other groups do. The Christians under the inspiration of the Spirit of God have taken this as an enduring principle to uh, symbolize the unity of the body of Christ as well as a remembrance of Christ's death on the cross. So some teachings are clearly rooted in a, a first century culture, but, but are universalized for all times. Now we also have to recognize that some of the first century practices were not intended to be universalized. For example, in 1 Timothy 5.23, Paul says to his young uh, charge, he says, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. No one today would suggest that uh, the medicinal cure for all of our stomach ailments would be wine. Uh, another place where he, Paul says uh, to greet one another with a holy kiss, all the churches of Christ greet you. We would expect though that if God were to want us to take a first century practice and universalize it, he would give us a rationale that would, that would help us see that it's not just limited. Otherwise, all of us would be traveling only by foot or by boat the way Jesus did, or, or uh, we would only be, um, or always be talking about send us the parchments the way Paul wrote. Certainly some things obviously were not meant to be enduring. So how is it that we can distinguish between that which is enduring and that which is only temporary? Um, the writers of scripture, we have to understand, were not bound by culture. We can't assume that just because it's not uh, common to our culture that it's uh, not true. They never shrunk back from teaching the things that were countercultural or unpopular. For example, in Galatians 2 and verse 3, Paul says, Not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. There was tremendous pressure of the, for the early Christians to go along with the circumcision of, of the Jewish people. It was so such a sharp contrast to, to disavow that and to not go along with it that there was tremendous persecution. But the Christians, Paul in particular, would not budge in his holding to the idea that circumcision was not a requirement to be a follower of Christ. Paul says in Galatians 5.11, he says, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? Then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. 
And, and also of the resurrection, that was not an, a popular thing. In Acts 17, 32, it says, Now when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer, but others said, We shall hear you again on this matter. So the, the apostles, the early Christians, were not averse to holding on to something that was countercultural. In the next section, we're gonna look at some examples. Uh, first of all, beginning with Galatians chapter three, verse 28, we're also gonna look at 1 Timothy chapter two. Two highly debated passages of scriptures. And we're gonna see from those passages a, a way to get beyond the, the cultural punting that so many people do and get down to the matter of what is God teaching us for the church today. So join us for our next session.